for part 11 of our HD Before Bed series, uh, the reading group for Jan van Denberg's Crash Course on Stars, we'll be looking at Regulus. And uh, I like Regulus, you know, it's, um, it's, it's one of the royal stars. I was just reading in, uh, in the last video, we were looking a little bit at that Chaldean numerology. And let me see, I actually have, uh, Regulus is associated with the number 23. So if you have, if you're born on the 23rd um, day of the month, for instance, that's the day of the month. That's what they call your base vibration in Chaldean numerology. Or anything else that adds up to 23. Uh, I guess the months don't. But for instance, if uh, you were born on the 10th month and the 13th day, or the 11th month and the 12th day, or the 12th month and the 11th day. You know, those all, those are all that would, uh, that would yield a 23 in uh, the Chaldean numerology uh, between your month and day, uh, which of course is not as prominent as if you're actually born on the 23rd day, which is called your base vibration. And then some years will be regulus years, you know, the entire year, which, which, you know, again, is not as specific as the day you're born because it lasts for the entire year. But you can imagine, uh, what would it be, 1994, for instance. That was a regular year because 1 plus 9 is 10, plus 9 again is 19, plus 4 is 23. And so my notes for 23, uh, it's the second command number, the royal star of the lion, the royal star of Regulus, and it's uh, Mercury associated with the moon and Jupiter. And that's because two plus three equals five, which is the number of Mercury in Chaldean numerology. And two is the moon and three is, is Jupiter. So that can kind of explain a little bit of, of its association. Regulus, the cardinal stars established the Maya. But above all, I want to introduce you to these cardinal stars. They established the Maya, no kidding. If you're fortunate enough to have a nodal alignment with any of these four stars, you are connected to this primal zone. Look it up, because it obviously has an influence in your life, though not to dramatize it. And so the cardinal stars are Fomalhat, Aldebaran, Regulus, and Antares. In the previous videos, we looked at Aldebaran and Antares. Antares influences the specific chemistry found as a codon for the ninth gate, what Aldebaran does for the 16th gate, and in that way operates in the larger context of your design. With the death of Sandalik, the Earth received three times as many neutrinos a second as normal for 14 and a half minutes. Thinking of King Lear, the one who became wise with age, finally confronts the truth, and in doing so, was able to enrich the coming generations. As a source of consciousness, the death of a star is a great tragedy. All of these stars, in their moment of closing out their existence, they all leave us something. One of the glories of what we are is that we put together this story. We manifest its data in unique forms and with unique possibilities. Um, he says here, he doesn't need to anthropomorphize Antares into a magical being to see it as an integral part of the life program and to respect and honor its existence. It's a part of the way his genes operate inside his form. With the four royal stars, we're looking at the foundation of the way. This must be a quote from Ra. This just reads so much like Ra. Either that or, or Jan has spent so much time with Ra that he's begun to write like him himself, which could be. Because usually when it's a quote from Ra, it, uh, it says so. But either way. With the four royal stars, we are looking at the foundation of the way in which we began to see ourselves in relation to the totality, to begin to see the extent of the Maya, and the first inklings in our imagination about how the Maya itself actually operates. 
In the time of the Persians, it was the summer solstice relative to the 15th gate. Regulus then was called the guardian of the north, the little king, and attributed with all kinds of powers. In this process on stars, Ra tried to understand the framework of what he called the establishing of our civilized consciousness history. On the right, you see what is known as the vessel of love. And the gates of the vessel of love are the cardinal points of the wheel, so to say. They express the annual cycle. And with that, along with the Sphinx, because its gates form halfway, the interregnums. And so, yeah, you can see uh, 25, 46, 10, and 15, the vessel of love, and then the interregnums to halfway. Here's 13, 1, 7, and 2 as the halfway points. Every epoch seems to cover 45 degrees. And here we have the sickle. That's nice. The Arabian asterism, the sickle. These, these stars together. So the vessel of love, the cardinal points of the wheel, and that express the annual cycle. And then the Sphinx, which are the gates 1, 2, 7, and 13, that are the interregnums. The question should arise, how exact is this all? And when exactly were these so-called cardinal stars on the cardinal points themselves? As you may see, that didn't happen at the same time for all four stars. But the closest is in this era. So it was never perfect, but basically they always formed a cross in the sky. This has driven us as a civilizing form, fundamental to the intellectual development of societies, a framework of the way in which the whole mechanism works. In the year 2341 before Common Era, Regulus came into gate 15, line one, the gate of the cardinal point in the quarter of civilization. While in the year 728 Common Era, or AD as we, you know, Regulus reached the quarter of duality after about 3,069 years in the quarter of civilization. Being just 200 million years old, Regulus is still a toddler with a great deal of instability in it. It has this incredibly fast equatorial rotation. The byproduct of spinning so fast is that there are different concentrations at one end than the other end. In fact, it gives off two distinctly different neutrino streams. Another thing is Regulus, as we see it, is actually about four stars. Regulus has a binary companion in a disk distance of 177. Not sure the symbol here. Oh, I guess minutes. It's, yeah, degrees, minutes, seconds. So this would actually be uh, seconds. So around 177 seconds thought to be physically related in another binary, Regulus B and C, all merging together in the bright light of the unstable evolving Regulus constellation. Regulus and the solar plexus mutation. Sitting on one of the arms of the cross of the sleeping phoenix, it's entering gate 59, line one in 2021. Wow. So Regulus actually as of this recording in 2023, is in gate 59, line one, and will be for the next 60 some odd years. In rave cosmology, that's about the impact on fertility and the whole intimacy system. But for Regulus, it's about leaving behind the whole cross of planning era. It becomes an accentuating point for a transformation in the way in which the species is actually going to live. And it covers the whole period until around 2443 before leaving gate 59.5. Jan writes, for him, what we're looking here at is a key. We have the note here of transitional architecture and the Ativ circuit. Solar plexus mutation. All children born after February 2027, born rave relative as well-born humans, are going to have a dysfunctional channel of synthesis. Only as a potential, the gates remain active. It makes it possible that raves and humans live next to each other. 
Although they use the same, I'm not sure what mala means here, but they use, so they live with a different kind of circuitry. It also changes the relation between humans and mammals, while the contract, 1949, is gone. Raves won't eat meat. And this is referring to the break that's happening. You kind of see there how 19 and 49 are uh, breaking in some sense. Both, the place of answers. When we're looking at our consciousness, this wheel is surrounded by a crystal consciousness field. It's at the very core of the cosmology of consciousness in our planet to understand that we are within a crystal consciousness field. These are so-called personality crystals, not incarnated in bundles. These personality crystals have each a relation to one of the 16 faces of the Godhead in the wheel. Each of these faces represents a way in which the neutrino ocean from the outside is filtered. In this particular case, it is Thoth. That is the place of answers. And Regulus has been there since around 800 Common Era. Carlus Magnus, emperor from 800, December 800 to January 814, succeeded in uniting the majority of Western and Central Europe. Well, that would be Charlemagne. Yeah, this is the, the Codon ring and, and so on. What we are looking at here is a chemical family called valine. If you look at all the hexagrams, 7, 4, 29, and 59, they have the same bottom alignment, and what is different is the top couplet. Right, they're all part of the godhead Thoth, so they're all yin, yang, yin, yin. And then the two on top, UAA, UAC, UAG, UAU. The top couplet brings out the uniqueness of what the particular gate is. So we have here a codon group that involves four different formulas. What you're seeing here is that Regulus has been yin, yin. That is, in the era that it's been passing through these gates, over the last 300 years or so, it's gone through its yin yang. Till 2021, it was yang yin, and now it's entering in the 59 and the yang yang. So this is how Regulus moves. Right, so it was in the yin yin of gate seven, the top couplet, and it was in the yin yang, gate four, the top couplet, then the yin yin, and now moving into the double yang, the top couplet in black there. Valine is a codon that gives us three fundamental answers that are possible for us that lay within all of us. All answers are rooted in the fourth gate. And then the seventh gate says, an answer to what it is to be in the world is to have a role. Find your role, your profile, by entering into things correctly. Without a role, you have no answer. Seven to the role gate. The 29th gate, the answer is to make a commitment to life itself by accepting life, by committing oneself to life, that the answer is there for one to find experientially. And then the 59th gate, the answer is make more. If you can't have the success yourself, you can live it out through your children. In other words, it's an answer to find intimacy in this life. It is an answer to reproduce in this life. Life is very mundane. For most, it's about getting up in the morning and going to sleep at night until we die. And that really is what it's about. The 29th gate, one of the four answers, the gate of making commitments. It's the gate of saying yes. One of the four answers, and these answers have to do with what is the way in this life to make more, to make a commitment to the other, to find a role, to understand the pattern. These are the answers that are brought forward. And it is specifically in gate 29 where it is this making of a commitment, the making a commitment to bringing out the answers. Regulus entered gate 29 in 1615. You couldn't better describe the overall phenomenon of the cross of planning cycle that began in 1615 that is going to end in 2027. It has been the deep, deep, deep pursuit for answers, but not for the answers in and of themselves. That's what's interesting. Answers are a mutative spark. It's the sparker. 
brings an intensity to mutative direction. It fosters mutation in inspecific places. Going through the earlier hexagrams of the quarter of civilization, you may see that Regulus has been a force that has moved with the evolution of the civilizing principle. And perhaps Regulus was the star of Bethlehem in the time Regulus entered gate 31, around 13 before Common Era. Not specific at the point of the rise of Judaic Christianity, which monotheistic direction was later on adopted as the official religion by Emperor Theodosius in 380 AD, whereas Emperor Constantine had already tolerated it. But coincidental to that peaking of the Roman Empire, the deep expression of influence, and influence through military conquests, which, by the way, is something that Regulus was regularly attached to, Jan writes that he has a distinct feeling that each of these four stars were deeply important indicators of accent points, accent points that can be seen in a historical perspective, where historical hindsight gives you the span of time to be able to look at the phenomena. And of course, making affiliations to certain planets can be seen in their time frame. In ancient times, the astrologers were very limited at that point in their knowledge base. And in a world where physical power meant everything, Mars and Jupiter were often chosen as the particular forces. Well, here's the start of understanding that these stars establish the construct because that's the thing where it's about. That's what it's about. So to go 7,000 years back, let's imagine no light you can reliably use to do anything. No books, no TV, no smartphone, only the minimal, like making a fire if necessary. And then that mysterious emptiness of the night sky with stars that move, bringing glory and the fear and this tribal common feeling. And later on in time, the story that an adult could tell a child and an adult could tell another adult. The story of the sky, watching it, marking it. And slowly but surely, over huge periods of time, there would be those, always those, the mad ones, the weird ones, the strange ones, who noticed something that nobody else had seen in that sky. That suddenly there's a marker in the sky that is consistent to crudely pushing stones into places in order to be able to follow the objects, to track them. And they watch to look at a Stonehenge and to understand what level of consciousness was there. Jan writes that he knows that it's not an accident that 5,000 years later, we're still talking about them, that you can Google them to death. They're still there. They set the construct. It doesn't mean that it was them specifically, because that is not the point. They were obviously very, they were obviously very powerful in terms of their luminosity and their attraction to us visually, against the backdrop of the sky, these stone monuments. And here we have um, an interesting graphic. Revelations 4-7. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like a bull. The third had a face like a man. And the fourth was like a flying eagle. Ezekiel 1.10, their faces looked like this. Each of the four had the face of a man. And on the right side, each had the face of a lion. And on the left, the face of a bull. Each also had the face of an eagle. So we see that the bull, Taurus. The lion, Leo. Looking at Regulus. The eagle, Scorpio. And the human is Aquarius. Interesting. And then the horse... The horse and the, the beast on the horse, Aries and Taurus, Cancer and Leo, Libra and Scorpio, Capricorn and Aquarius. The four horses are the four cardinal points, spring, summer, fall, and winter. The four faces of the beasts, the horsemen, are the four fixed signs, Taurus the bull, Leo the lion, Scorpio the eagle, and Aquarius, the human being themselves. the archangel stars, the horsemen of the apocalypse. But again, they are the point of the sphere 
of a huge amount of information, and we can never fully deconstruct them from it. But our ancestors that knew them generation after generation could point to them in the sky generation after generation. They pointed out something for us to understand. These are the carriers. They're the horsemen of the apocalypse. The book of Revelations in the Bible gives this story about the four horsemen. These four tetramorphs refer also to the four evangelists that originated from the Jewish prophet Ezekiel, who, while in exile in Babylon, circa 550 BC, used the symbolism of Babylonian astrology for his own prophetic purposes, where the four zodiac signs are represented as being a throne of God himself. Regulus entering gate 59 and the birth of a conscious penta. It's quite a complex thing for an actual rave entity to emerge because a rave is a conscious penta, three of them together. And Jan writes, he almost bets his bottom dollar on it. When Regulus enters gate 59, you're going to see the birth of a conscious penta. Well, that's so interesting. I mean, didn't, uh, we were just looking at, um, that it entered into gate 59, line one in 2021. So that's where it is right now. It's very interesting to see that. So we may, after 2027, see the birth of a conscious penta. Again, to be able to see these four stars in the context of, of what is all, it is what it's all about, to see them in context. It's about traveling. The fact of the matter is that each of them is in a particular quadrant of the sky as an instrument that has operated exclusively in four particular domains, turning the wheel. And not the inner wheel, but a turning of the emphasis from the outer influence. So a kind of shell game in terms of the layers of movement and neutrino information and the way in which it works. In that sense, we can begin to deconstruct what they're about. If Regulus is primarily about civilization, Antares is primarily about, primarily about duality. Fomalhaut is about mutation. Aldebaran is about initiation. And they are incarnates of those particular themes. It's a movement, and the stars represent this. Let me see the graphic here of each horseman expressing a zodiac sign, riding a horse expressing the next sign, expressing movement. This wheel is one of the great wonders. As you're moving along here, we're moving in a genetic track. Not only are we having an influence on us in terms of the way in which our personality consciousness is going to operate, we're also being impacted at the cellular level. So this is accenting a specific aspect. And Jan writes here, he thinks that the alignment with that aspect is quite something. Regulus was moving us in the sense that we have known it over the last hundreds of years as moving us toward answers, which means genetically that it has affected that area in us that leads to our readiness to commit, to finding an answer, not being satisfied if not having the answer, and everything about our cycle. 29.5, the tendency to bite off more than one can chew. This transit from the 29.5 to the 29.6 in 1953. So since 1615, we went through an era where we have, where we had to have desperately, we were desperately looking for an answer for everything. And the fact is that we've gone past that into a state of confusion. 29.6 is known as confusion. Going through the fifth line, we went through overreach. So overreach began in 1887 and ended in 1953. The tendency to bite off more than one can chew. And so this uncontrollable drive to say yes, overextending resources, that started in the late 1800s and all through the first half of the century, we were in a state of biting off more than we could chew, of overreach collectively. Then in 1953, entering into the state of confusion where momentum outstrips awareness, driving blind, the power to persevere that makes no sense. 
and or withdrawal and the power and confusion to caution and to say no because we're so confused. So we've seen both blindly going on since 1953 or because of all the confusion, this withdrawal. And it's it wasn't until 2021 that we entered into the preemptive strike. So that which can be either a real indecisiveness uh, or the authority and vitality that an understanding purpose and direction can eliminate barriers. So preemptive strike, getting rid of the barrier before it's a problem, preemptively taking care of it. You know, I have Siberian elms on the property here, these invasive trees, and it's like pulling them up as it shoots before they take root. And that's what we've kind of moved into. But it's interesting to see that we really went through this period of overreach and of great commitment and then moving into confusion. Two events in 1953 in relation to Regulus seem prominent. The first is the return of the Shah in Persia, in Iran, with the help of the CIA. And the second is the ending of the Korean War under threat of President Eisenhower to use nuclear weapons or invade China. Both answers only allowed both conflicts to grow in time, as you may know. It brought us to the state that exists where momentum outstrips awareness. And then gate 59, line one, the preemptive strike. And what that 59th gate is going to be like, because it's not going to be like, make more. There's a huge dynamic shift that's going to take place. And yes, begin 2022, the Ukraine war, the start of a new era. And in the same time, the sister of Kim Jong-un warned South Korea in making a preemptive strike. Here we have a picture of Regulus and Leo on the ecliptic line. Occultation which means when one um, star or planet goes in front of, uh, you know, when, when a star is occulted, it means there's a planetary body in front of it. Stars that are positioned along the ecliptic can actually be occulted by planetary objects, particularly the moon. Any of these stars is significant because the moon is a great carrier of information. It is one of the dynamic forces of orchestrating life on the planet. And with that also affecting our personality consciousness. Regulus is occulted by the moon every 9.3 years. The last time between December 2016 and July 2017, every month. Regulus has also had occultations with Mercury and Venus, rare but possible. Occultation with Venus will occur on October 1st, 2044. Those eight points on the wheel the G center, because of the two crosses, the Sphinx and the vessel, represents the mechanics of the way in which the larger program unfolds. It's also the center where the magnetic monopole holds us together in the illusion of our separateness. And it happens to do so through the function of the nodes. So there was the cross and humans transformed it into the two dimensional. And they began to build a construct, no telescopes and all that stuff. It was an astonishing thing that they were able to see it, meditating on what they saw. And then to map the, plant, the points and eventually lay out the grid. Incredible. However, don't let us get in trouble with old Regulus. To move on and begin to build a construct. The lights in the sky were the gods long before the gods, before the gods had names, before the gods had images. It was the sky itself. So this construct, this dividing the sky, making it accessible, filling it up with recognizable creatures, giving it values, beginning to do something so profound, the macrocosm came to existence out of the microcosm because it was already the macrocosm to the microcosm. It's all one thing and we are it. And it was Regulus alone that was pushing the ball forward. Omohat. All right. This is a good um, place to stop for now. Thank you so much for, for watching. Uh, I've had a, I've really been enjoying doing these. That was part 11 of our HD Before Bed series where we've been doing uh, reading of Jan van Denberg's Crash Course on Stars. And uh, we just looked at the star Regulus. 
And in the next episode, we will take a look at FOMO Hunt. So looking forward to that. And thank you for coming on this journey with me. Till next time. Thank you.